Municipal Council. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Councilwoman Sandoval. All right, that took a little bit less time than we thought. So we might have time to go a little bit further than I thought in our conversations with group living. So what we have now is a briefing on 1029 and I see Andrew Webb up in the queue. So for colleagues, you received my email, but for the public, we're going to spend uh, several committee time having, top having conversations on multiple topics. Uh, Webb and CPD have a briefing today about household size, but it looks like based off of the time we have, we may even have time today to start the conversation about household size and then continue for the full two hours next Tuesday. So Andrew, I see you're up. You can introduce yourself, bring up your presentation and we will, you will go through your presentation and it seems like we're gonna have time to get into a, starting a dialogue today. So, oh, I see Sarah as well. So I'll let you both introduce yourself and you all can take it away. Sarah, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Sure, yeah, good morning, thanks for having us. Andrew's gonna pull up the presentation, but I was just gonna make a few intro remarks while he does that. Um, we were are really glad to be back after the last Ludi Committee where we presented on September 1st and wanted to just um, let you all know that uh, we heard you and um, there's a strong desire from City Council to have more time to dive into this really complex package of zoning code changes and uh, we've worked with the uh, Ludi chair on a schedule that Andrew will show you in a minute where we get um, to spend more time kind of going topic by topic, which we heard from a lot of you would be really helpful um, to try to parse them out and really dive in. Um, so today uh, we wanted to just quickly kind of confirm with you all some of the big issues we heard at the last committee meeting, uh, review the schedule that I just mentioned, and then um, we were planning to tee up and set some expectations, kind of some of the big things around the first big topic we'll dive in on next week, which is household size. Um, so we'll do that. And then it sounds like depending on how much time we have, maybe be able to start answering some questions. Um, although we were planning next week to bring them in more detail um, to help present and tee that up for you all. You go to the next slide, Andrew. So um, just very quickly, what we heard from you all at our last Ludi committee meeting um, is, um, as I mentioned, the need to have more time to focus on each of the big components. Um, so we're hopeful that this new um, schedule where we can go uh, topic by topic will help address that. We also heard uh, loud and clear that there's a lot of concerns around the inequity of having two zoning codes. Uh, as I think people know, but just to make sure for folks watching at home, um, when the Denver zoning code was adopted 10 years ago, about 20% of the city's land area remained under what's known as former chapter 59 or the old zoning code um, because of very complex site specific um, entitlements for those properties that are still under the old code that are um, difficult to translate and bring into the new code. So they kept their old code zoning. And at that time um, in 2010, city council passed uh, an ordinance that they would not change the old code at all that we um, can't make changes to it. Um, that's because the intent was always to get rid of it and freeze it in time so that um, hopefully that would encourage people to zone out of it and um, kind of figured, I think the thinking at the time, I was not there 10 years ago, was that um, if you freeze the code and um, don't have it evolve over time, um, it's more likely that we'll, we'll eventually get rid of it and also um, hopefully help push everybody. And, you know, here we are 10 years later. And so uh, an important message today for you to hear is that CPD agrees um, that this isn't sustainable to have the two codes. Um, it creates a lot of inefficiencies as well as um, a great inequity, particularly when you look at a project like this, um, when there are lots of neighborhoods that wouldn't have the same impacts because they're under the old code. And that will be one of the topics that we're planning to bring to a future Ludi committee meeting where we can share with you some of the ideas we have of how to um, solve that issue. Um, another big one, like I, I mentioned, the one we'll tee up for October 6th uh, next week is household size. We heard a lot of concerns about that um, and, and have throughout the process and have already made um, changes already on this topic and um, are definitely open to more dialogue and conversation about um, how we address some of the concerns around this topic for sure. And that includes both um, enforcement as well as um, one of the focal points of this project, I think, which is the number of how many people, particularly unrelated adults, can live in one dwelling unit. 
We also heard a lot of questions and concerns last Ludi committee about um, the residential care category and in particular, um, the smaller community corrections uh, facilities that would be allowed are proposed to be allowed in the lower intensity residential neighborhoods throughout Denver, um, as well as some concerns about the type two um, category, um, in particular that it goes up to um, 40 people. So wanted you all to know, we these are all things we're planning to um, bring back in these future topics and dive in and have more dialogue and conversation um, about uh, potential changes or um, you know other ways that we can address concerns on all of these topics. We also heard um, a lot of questions and concerns at the last committee meeting about the process um, and in particular the group living advisory committee um, that um, was not the only form of community engagement. We heard from um, many many people throughout this process that helped shape the proposal um, but the committee um, just like with many of our projects we have a committee that for, uh, spends a lot of time kind of diving into the details throughout what's now been an almost three year process. And um, we wanted to acknowledge um, a lot of the great points that came up and we're taking those to heart and thinking about some of the existing projects we have or future ones that we're about to launch. So for example, the affordable housing zoning incentive, um, which has already kicked off as well as the residential infill um, zoning amendment, which we plan to launch next year. Um, we are reevaluating how we think about um, committee membership and, and are always thinking about across all of our projects beyond just the committee, how do we do a better job um, getting voices at the table, um, you know, exploring things like community navigators, for example, something we're looking at for residential infill, um, where we use people in the community who are trusted um, amongst those who might not be as likely to show up at a meeting, um, at, or have barriers, you know, that prevent them um, from getting involved in some of these government processes. So we're um, always looking for ways to do better and heard a lot of your concerns um, and are also um, continuing to talk to the community on this one and um, happy to keep the dialogue going. We really want to get as much input as we can. Andrew's already just in the last um, two weeks presented at four different RNO and community organizations as well as a um, a city council organized um, district-wide meeting on this topic. Um, so we are um, very aware of the process concerns and looking for ways that we can learn from this and do better um, in our projects that are coming up. Um, so that's kind of the recap of what we heard. And now um, we're going to shift. I'll uh, hand it over to Andrew to talk about uh, where we hope to go from here. Great, thank you for that intro, Sarah. Uh, again, I'm Andrew Webb, I work for Planning Services at CPD, and I've been the project manager for this effort for the last uh, two and a half, coming up on three years now. Uh, so uh, what I'm gonna start with is uh, an outline of a proposed schedule for, uh, for moving forward uh, uh, in Ludi uh, to consider e each of some of the, the key topics that have come up in, in this discussion. Uh, this is in, in response to requests we've heard from you to have time dedicated to really digging into some of the topics. So uh, uh, today I will uh, tee up a little bit the uh, discussion of household regulations and then we'll plan to have a, a full meeting dedicated to that a week from today on October 6th. Uh, and at that, at that meeting, we'll look at some potential uh, alternatives that could be revisions or amendments to what is proposed here uh, to address some of the concerns you've heard. And we'll get a, a, a slide deck out later this week that actually walks through some of those alternatives um, and some of the pros and cons, caveats for each. But I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch on some of them today as well. Uh, we will all then uh, come back uh, briefly on November 3rd to give uh, to kind of tee up the conversation around residential care. And then we'll come back to another full uh, Ludi committee uh, meeting on November 10th, uh, during which we'll consider the, the issues that uh, Sarah just mentioned related to residential care that we've heard uh, from you, uh, community corrections in, in some of the smaller res care settings and uh, uh, the size of facilities. Uh, then on uh, November 17th, we'll uh, come back and speak to 
some of the, the topics that are external to uh, this amendment to the Denver Zoning Code, but are, are certainly very important uh, as they relate to it, including uh, former Chapter 59, uh, our uh, enforcement and ensuring uh, uh, more equity in our enforcement processes, uh, and then post-adoption monitoring, uh, how we would observe moving forward that we are uh, accomplishing the goals of this project and not having it, uh, unintended consequences. And then finally, our plan is to come back in uh, early December and ask the committee for uh, wrap up the discussion, weave in any potential amendments, and then ask the committee for, uh, for final action on this package of amendments. So because I won't have a chance to uh, to tee up the discussion on the 17th about former chapter 59. I wanted to talk about that just a little bit right now uh, so you can be aware of, of, of what we're thinking. Uh, we are looking at a couple ways to address that issue. And as Sarah said, we, we, we hear those concerns. We agree that it is an increasingly an equity issue, especially as we continue to keep the Denver zoning code up to date and, and leave uh, the, the old code further and further behind. So we're looking at a couple ways to address this in, in the context of, or one way to address this in the context of group living in the short term is a possible uh, bridge amendment to the revised municipal code uh, that would make uh, updated residential regulations in the Denver zoning code effective in areas with the old code zoning. And then another uh, uh, approach that we'll talk a little bit more about on, on the 17th is uh, prioritizing CPD staff resources in 2021 for, uh, for bigger solutions, such as proactively rezoning uh, areas that, that still have retained that old code zoning. So uh, in the next couple slides, I'll spend kind of teeing up uh, next week's conversation on households. Uh, I know that uh, uh, we've, we've talked about this exhaustively, but I, I wanted to uh, review a few things. Um, when, we, when we think about households, uh, most of us uh, in, imagine families uh, uh, of relatives living together, but, but we know that households in Denver and cities all over the country and all over the world are made up of, of all different types of groups of people, uh, including people. Uh, uh, chosen families of people who, who have found uh, uh, people to live with that uh, provide the same kind of companionship and, and camaraderie uh, and assistance with day-to-day -day activities as a, as a related family does. Uh, we know there are, that households are made up of people simply seeking affordable options uh, uh, to share housing costs. And increasingly, um, that uh, is seen as families uh, coming together to live together and share housing costs. Um, we've talked a bit about uh, equity as it relates to this, uh, the, the household definition. And I would just highlight here that uh, Denver's average household size is fairly small, about 2.3 uh, people uh, compared to the national average of about 2.5. Um, and the number of houses with six or more adults uh, is, is also fairly small, about 2%. But the percent of those that are uh, Black or Latinx is 80%, suggesting that uh, communities of color are more likely uh, to, to live in, in situations where families or unrelated uh, people are sharing housing. Uh, and our, our current regulations, which as, as we've talked about before, uh, date back to the, to the 1950s, prevent most of these common uh, uh, configurations by limiting the number of unrelated people who are allowed to live together. So uh, when we came to you uh, back on the first, we set forth a proposal that would have allowed up to five adults to live in any household uh, and then uh, uh, additional adults to live in larger house structures uh, and larger dwelling units uh, uh, by square footage, uh, uh, additional square footage of finished floor area. Um, and we are uh, looking at a few alternatives based on the feedback we heard then and what we've uh, heard from, from council members and the community since. Uh, these may include uh, reducing the numbers, so reducing that base number of five adults down to some lower number of unrelated adults permitted in a household, establishing a, and then establishing a zoning permit requirement for larger households up to some other threshold. Uh, and that would give the opportunity for our residential review uh, teams to uh, confirm that the parking uh, is required and that uh, the necessary fire safety uh, requirements are met. Uh, 
we might also look at, or we'll also bring forward an alternative for you to consider uh, that would not only do both of those things, but would also establish a total cap of adults regardless of relationship. One of the things that we've heard is, uh, from, from you and others is that though the code currently allows uh, unlimited family members to live together uh, with up to two unrelated adults. Uh, there was concern that if we allowed more unrelated adults plus unlimited family members that it could lead to some very large households. And so we'll, we'll come back and talk about a, a possible uh, limit of the total number of adults that could be in a house. Uh, and then finally, we'll uh, come back and talk a little bit more about uh, allowing unrelated adults in larger households by bedroom instead of by square feet of finished floor area. And this is something that we talked about over the last couple of years with the Group Living Advisory Committee and have a lot of strong, strong opinions both ways and some, some peer city research that we'll bring to bear on that conversation. Uh, and then we'll also look at some other ideas that have been uh, offered up to us as well, uh, including uh, potentially a separate use type for houses of unrelated adults and those uh, with related adults. So this is the way some cities, Aurora is an example, do this, where you either are a house of up to X number of unrelated adults or you're a, a, an unlimited family household. Uh, and then we'll look at... Um, We'll go back and look again at what the group living project team uh, proposed and took out to the community in February and March, our original proposal of simply just allowing uh, a number of adults in any household, regardless of relationship. Uh, and, and, and we'll talk about what some of those scenarios might look like and, and potential compromises. Uh, and we'll also outline uh, uh, potential caveats uh, with any of these options as well when we come back on the 6th. Uh, so uh, do expect a, a slide deck uh, later this week that'll give you the opportunity to kind of uh, pre-review and, and think through these. And that's what, uh, that's what we have for today. So uh, with that, I'm happy to, to stand for any additional questions if you'd like to talk more about this uh, draft schedule or, or other matters. Glad to, glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Andrew. And the one thing that I would add for the for those watching on the three dates where the full committee is dedicated to those topics. So that's October 6th, November the 10th and November the 17th. We will we will be starting at 10 a.m. Uh, for any other uh, Ludi committee, the regularly scheduled time of 1030 will apply. We did start at 10 a.m. today because I wanted to make sure we had enough time for uh, Councilwoman Sandoval's uh, proposals that went by fairly smoothly. So. Colleagues, since we're here, I, I don't see any issue with starting to get into the conversation and the questions. And I see multiple uh, council members whose hands up. So I guess you all agree with me. So we can we can start this conversation. And Councilman Flynn, you're up. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And actually, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, getting down into the conversation about uh, what kind of changes or amendments we want to see. But I just want to address uh, the briefing. Uh, let me get over to my... Go ahead. Uh, document here. I have uh, uh, three uh, main observations. Uh, plus, uh, Andrew, I had a, a list of questions at the first meeting on September 1st that weren't yet addressed here. So maybe what I'll do is I'll email them to you and see if we can get answers to uh, to those questions that I have. Uh, but first of all, I'm sorry. I can, I'll actually, I can respond to that quickly. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I'll bring, we'll have responses to those questions in the slide deck that goes out for the October 6th meeting. Oh, okay. Be helpful to have them uh, 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 prior to that. But <clears throat> I just want to make sure that I, I watched the video again, and I wrote down the questions that I threw out there. And uh, so I'll, I'll send that to you just so you know, uh, you can see what uh, questions I'm expecting to get answers to. Thank you. Uh, but first of all, with regard to Chapter 59, I actually don't have much interest right now in, in building a bridge or resolving that issue when we have an amendment out there that 90% of the public comments so far has been in opposition. So frankly, uh, my neighborhoods that are in chapter, 50, chapter 59 were great, greatly relieved that they were exempt from this. So to pursue uh, a measure that would make them <clears throat> subject to it is not something I'm interested in pursuing until we resolve the broader issue of what does what are the regulations going to be before I go to my chapter 59 neighborhoods and say, here's what it is now. Uh, uh, secondly, I think the equity discussion regarding household size and households of color is a red herring because the data that I've seen from census is that essentially households of color tend to have multi-generational families, and that's why they're larger uh, than 
white households, that's already legal. That's not, we don't open up the door to any more of those very small households of color. You said there are 2% of households are six or more unrelated, uh, unrelated adults or adults? It's adults. Adults. Uh, but I think it's a red herring because we're, we're uh, maybe not intentionally, but we're confusing the issue by saying that households of color tend to be a little larger. Therefore, uh, the current code is discriminatory. Well, no, it isn't because you can have grandma and aunt and uncle and and your brother-in-law uh, living with you, uh, et cetera, already. So this doesn't open that up. What this opens up is, and basically what I've seen with all the, pardon me, there's my clock again. Uh, what, what I've seen uh, from the, uh, the folks who are pushing this proposal is I've seen a lot of, a lot of white uh, voices saying we want to do this because we want to have housing co-ops and things like that. So to say that this is, uh, that this is something we need to do for households of color, I think is a red herring. And then lastly, I think the process concern that we've had isn't really resolved by, and thank you, by the way, for coming to Bear Valley uh, or for that Zoom meeting and the other meetings you've done, but it's all after the fact. Uh, so there wasn't really an opportunity for authentic input into, into the proposal itself. Basically, everybody is now in a position of having to react to what's already been, uh, been uh, drawn up. So uh, those are my comments uh, on, on the briefing here, and uh, I will send the uh, questions, I had eight questions here that I asked on the first and to make sure that we have answers to those. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Flynn. Councilwoman Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanna reiterate what I said at the last meeting is that I recognize the problems that we're trying to solve and I also want to solve them. So I just wanna be on the record for that. And as you know, I've been meeting with hundreds of my constituents to um, help them understand this. Um, and as more and more people learn about it, um, the opposition to it in my district is becoming even stronger. So thank you for listening to our concerns and to considering um, some changes um, to make it more, uh, acceptable to to more people. I was really just going to make some of the same points that Kevin did about the uh, Councilman Flynn about the family size. So uh, just I think it's really important for everyone who might be watching that family size is not limited now, nor is it proposed to be limited. So this group living proposal does not uh, change that situation at all that multi-generational families can can live together now. Um, my question is, Andrew, about co-ops. And we've heard from a lot of people who are in favor of co-ops. And I know there, there was someone on your committee who, uh, who runs a co-op and is an advocate for them. Do you feel like there's a huge demand for co-ops in our city? I think, that, you know, for anecdotally, I certainly have heard uh, people express interest, and we know that there are quite a few in operation in the city. Um, I've heard from 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 people who say they're living in co-op situations. There's not a there's not a, a single definition of how a co-op works, and there are a lot of households that operate in part like a co-op, uh, or or have you know some level of intentionality, um, but. Uh, certainly, we know that there is interest uh, within individual households uh, to to do uh, some of those uh, types of arrangements, uh, and there's also interest in uh, in communities of of setting up uh, households like that in their in their neighborhoods to allow for a, a lower cost uh, equity building housing option. So you I you just said there's quite a few. How many is that? Are there 20 yeah. or 500 or? Uh, no, I, I would say it is a fairly small number. Let's say, you know, I, I, uh, again, I, I have not kept a list of, comp you know, people who are specifically interested in, in starting a co-op, but I can say I've probably heard from about a dozen people who, who with, uh, in, in separate situations that, that have uh, interest in a, uh, in setting something like that up. Okay, a dozen. All right. So um, a lot of the conversations about household size um, included discussions about co-ops. And I, I've either participated or 
participated in the meetings um, live or I watched them. And it was a big part of the conversation. And I feel like it's one of the reasons uh, the, the proposed limit of 10 plus unlimited family members was partially driven by the discussion of co-ops. And I don't believe there's a huge demand for them. I don't think, you know, if you've heard from a dozen or so, I don't think that's a huge demand. And so I'm interested in what Boulder has and they have a separate ordinance um, around co-ops and you have to get a permit for one. And um, it seems to me that we should kind of separate those two household size and then do something different for co-ops. Um, I'm not opposed to them, but I feel like those two things should be separated. But do you know how many co-ops there are in Boulder? There are 11 in Boulder currently. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're good, Councilman Black? Yep. Councilwoman Sawyer, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Andrew, I really appreciate your willingness to, to come back and engage in these conversations. Um, and thanks to all of everyone who's been willing to split out um, a lot of these different conversations and, and go take deeper dives into each one of them. Um, so thanks a lot for that. I, I guess um, around the chapter 59 conversation, um, I agree with Councilman Flynn's points that, you know, it, is it worth having this conversation until we sort of look at, at some of the bigger overarching picture um, questions about, about what's going on here. Um, my, my other question around that is HOAs, right? So when we're talking about um, equitably distributing um, land use across our city, you know, Andrew, you and I have talked a lot about HOAs and the fact that, you know, HOAs can enact stricter rules, right? So is it worth um, having the chapter 59 discussion when there are so many, there are 998 active HOAs in the city and county of Denver that can enact, if they want to, stricter rules around group living, which would, um, you know, potentially exclude all of these changes that we're doing, you know, anyway, and there would be no way for the city to, um, to enforce the city's ordinances in any of those HOAs. So it, it wouldn't be equitably distributed across the city anyway, then. I'm, I'm just not sure it's worth spending the time talking about chapter 59 and worrying about equitable land use distribution anyway, if we've got this HOA issue, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, and, and I may ask uh, Sarah to also uh, jump in on and talk a little bit about HOAs. Uh, with regard to former oh. chapter 59, you know, we're, our thinking is that we'll walk through some of the other key topics first before we focus on former chapter 59 so that it's clear to you and, and, and your constituents what final, you know, regulations may apply. Um, uh, but, you know, certainly I, 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 I hear your point. Sarah, do you want to talk at all about um, HOAs? Yeah, I'll just that. And I, I just would emphasize on the former chapter 59 that that's exactly why we put it at the end so that we can focus on the topics first and then then have the conversation of, well, shouldn't the solutions apply everywhere? And I, I really just want to iterate that we understand there's some communities that uh, currently might feel relieved or that there's that dynamic of uh, wanting to stay under the old code. But I think regardless of this project, we just wanted to highlight that as a department, we don't think it makes sense, right? We heard loud and clear from you all that this is an inequity when you have two different codes and that doesn't make sense. So we just wanted to be clear kind of regardless of group living, which is something we need to address now because this package is in front of you, but it's gonna come up on future projects as well. It's gonna keep coming up when you do these big citywide amendments that it's something we need to solve together. And that's why we wanna keep talking about it. But for the HOAs, uh, we hear you. And honestly, this has been a struggle CPD's dealt with for years. We have HOAs across the city right now that have rules in place that I would say make our, our city inequitable. They can override zoning technically in any way they want. There's all kinds of things that HOAs already put in place. And this has come up on plenty of text amendments before when we allowed people to um, sell produce that they grow out of their homes, when we allowed backyard chickens, all that, right? People say, but that's not fair because if you have an HOA, and I guess, I think we just struggle with why on this one, does that all of a sudden mean we shouldn't do the right thing in our zoning code? 
we've had that issue for decades. And if council wants to tackle the inequities of HOAs, I think um, that's a different conversation to us because it's not just about group living. It's about the whole concept of having a private homeowners organization that can set their own rules, rules for their neighborhood. Um, it's not, it, it impacts all of our zoning code, basically. There's tons of things in our zoning code that an HOA could create a different rule about. And so we hear you and agree, but we're also struggling with how to say that means that this particular tax amendment shouldn't go forward because that dynamic has always been there. Um, and I guess as long as HOAs are in place, we'll continue to be there for, for all of our zoning work. Okay. I mean, I guess my, it, it's just a little bit different when you're talking about, you know, like chickens in a backyard versus, you know, like something as dramatic or as, you know, potentially um, uh, altering to the way people live as having, you know, a, a shelter or a community corrections facility next door. If that is, those are two totally different things. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a significantly different conversation having chickens in your backyard or having a community corrections facility next door. It's not. Yeah, the agreed. It's agreed. Conversation, you know. Yeah, they're being so, like, why now? To answer your question of why now, that's mm -hmm. why now, right? I mean, that's why. Those are. That's a. That's not. That's not sure. The and then I think again, the question is understand those impacts are very different. And I, I mean, I would argue there are, there are other things HOA that I've heard of anyway. I don't I don't have an HOA in my property in Denver, but I'm aware of anyway. hearing stories right of HOAs that put pretty strict. Um, uh, things in place that create other inequities. So it may not be about backyard chickens at all, but certain things you have to do in terms of maintaining your property, certain things you can and can't do to your home that I would argue also create inequities, you know, that certain homeowners now have to pay to do those things, others don't. But sure. I think the fundamental issue is um, not part of zoning, like HOA, HOAs really, they're not created by CPD. Or have, and so we don't know how to get rid of you know, an HOA is not something that we have purview over or the zoning code can change. So I hear you, I think it's an important point, but I think that's probably, I, I don't even know, an attorney would probably have to weigh in on what kind of um, legal or, you know, actions could the city take to address that inequity, inequity because it's certainly not CPD that can fix that problem. Right, of course. And I mean, I think the answer is none, right? I mean, this there is legal precedent that clearly indicates that there is there's nothing we can do about it. That's a private entity um, that people buy into. But when we're talking about equitable land use, that is an issue that we have to consider. So um, I just, I think it's, it might be um, a broader conversation when we're talking about equitable land use. We may need to consider that um, in a deeper, in a deeper way as we look at this, at this conversation. So um, that's all, you know, that I, that I just wanted to bring up because if we're going to, if we're going to be talking about chapter 59 in an equitable land use kind of way, I think we, we need, it, it, it deserves bearing out, you know, and, um, and at least looking into in a, in a, in a deeper way, because it's not going to be equitably um, distributed because of this HOA issue. That's just the reality of the situation. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Sawyer. Councilwoman Torres, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Andrew and uh, Sarah, I just want to thank you for the uh, 13th slide, um, in particular comparing peer cities. Um, I'm wondering um, on the unrelated adult permission, are these also, um, do they have similar language about related uh, family being unlimited? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. It, and it varies uh, by city. There are some, uh, uh, Aurora I mentioned and Albuquerque is another that allow either a group of unrelated adults to live together up to a certain number or a family of related people to live together in an unlimited fashion and does, and without a blending of the two uh, and it varies by city. Okay. Are there any of these folks who have hard caps on um, adults related or unrelated in general or are they similar in terms of kind of complying with building code? None of them limit the number of family members who can live together, but 
uh, most of them do limit the number of unrelated adults or all of them that, that are on that chart limit the number of unrelated adults who can live together. What I also think is interesting is um, the relative similarity between the actual average household size um, not having changed much. None of them go, go above three, um, which signifies to me the vast majority are two or even lower than two um, if they're actually allowed five, six, and upwards of eight. Is that a, 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 a reasonable takeaway? It is, yeah. Uh, essentially, even in, in cities that do allow uh, more unrelated adults to live together, there is not a, a, a market change in the number of people who, who, who live in households across the board. Um, the intergenerational piece um, I get is already in there. We already allow it. It wouldn't be necessarily changed. Here's what is of uh, concern for me about not modifying this in a, in a meaningful way. And that's, um, one is that uh, we can't assume families operate in any one way in this city um, or period, or that we're, it's all based on relationship. And the, the change in household is not just based on um, uh, kind of our, our, our recognition that um, LGBT parents um, uh, live in Denver and are raising families, grandparents are living in Denver and raising grandkids and beyond. It goes beyond that. Um, and while it might not be an overwhelming voice or majority, we have um, extended friends raising kids of their, of their family members. Um, or, or of their neighbors. Um, this was not uncommon when I was growing up and it's not uncommon now in West Denver. Um, the point is, I would like CPD out of that business, out of that business and being able to determine who lives in a household together and what makes up a, a family and what doesn't. Um, it, it's not prescriptive and it's not um, a storybook or um, some narrative that 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 made sense to me when I was growing up. Um, it's grown, it's evolved, and I don't also think that the demand of those who would like to live in a co-op style house can be based on uh, anecdotally who we've received interest interest from when we don't allow it. It's a false place to start in saying. Um, it, uh, it's only affecting a couple different um, uh, areas of interest. Um, I need every option at the table when I'm thinking about how to keep folks housed in District 3. Um, we are looking at having lost 4,000 uh, residents from District 3 alone um, since just the last three years because they can't afford to live there. Um, I need every option on the table, even if it's less than 10% of who actually take advantage of it. Um, and, and I can't get caught up in what does CPD determine is a family relationship um, and what isn't because they need a roof over their head. Um, the equity piece, I think, is getting thrown around in really interesting ways here because um, I'm also responding and, and taking a look at neighborhoods who are talking about retaining um, the look and feel of their community. And um, they're not people of color who are chiming into my inbox um, uh, uh, to reject this proposal. So um, I look forward to the next three meetings and us diving more deeply into this. Um, and, uh, and, and just wanted to make sure that my position on why this is a necessary um, discussion for us and an opening that District 3 needs um, that I don't think is very different from a lot of other districts in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Torres. Councilwoman Kanich.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to follow up on a couple of the really good questions from my colleagues. Um, first, um, Councilman Sawyer brought up the, the HOA issue and she said, you know, it's kind of inevitable. There's a difference between, you know, the backyard chicken coop and a residential, you know, shelter. But I actually wanted to ask Andrew um, uh, to clarify. Uh, and I think what we may need is a memo on this topic. I think we need, and I know we have all these slide decks, but sometimes a one pager that's focused on a topic is easier. And especially, um, so, and, and we may wanna have, um, you know, I see Nathan Lucero's in here, but the state of Colorado governs, you know, some of these matters and the Fair Housing Act is involved. And so I actually, Andrew, can you actually clarify, could an HOA keep out a shelter from its community under its HOA rules? An, an HOA could not keep out any group of people who fall into one of the protected classes in the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, can you share, um, or Nathan maybe can, what some of those protected classes are? I can, or we'll see if Nathan wants to add to that. Um, but generally it includes, uh, you know, uh, uh, race and creed, um, age, uh, uh, disability, uh, those types of, uh, of identifiers. Right. So for example, a, a group home that had people with developmental disabilities or a shelter for the homeless, we have a, a high co-occurrence of mental illness, which is a recognized um, disability under the, the Fair Housing Act. Not, not all people who are homeless, very not, you know, it's definitely not a majority, but there is a, for those who are unsheltered that we're trying to bring into some of the new 24-7 uh, shelter models that we're trying to do, a little more person-centered models. If someone, if, 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 a, if a number of the folks being served had mental illness, that would, is that considered a disability? That would certainly be considered a disability. Uh, people in recovery are considered to also have a disability. There are other groups that, that, that might use these types of facilities as well. And then we also have some state law as well regarding um, seniors or people with disabilities, even if it's not a caretaker situation, if they just want to live together. So we're using this term co-op. And um, I think that, you know, it's kind of... Um, I don't want to make stereotypes, but I think that you know there's there's kind of two kinds of co-ops I've seen in Denver. This term is kind of used sometimes with young people, right? And and it's you know a very intentional way of living with you know agreements. We also have co-housing, which is a little different. We have some senior co-housing, but but there are people who may not use that term. And so I just wanted to ask about the state law in terms of seniors or people with disabilities. If you can refresh us on that. Yeah, the, the, the state group home statute uh, requires Colorado municipalities to accommodate groups of up to eight people who care for themselves, who aren't re receiving professional care in a, in a residential setting uh, as a household in zoning. And so that includes people with uh, intellectual uh, uh, disabilities, with mental illness, and people over the age of 60. And do we know, can an HOA um, override that state law? They could not. Okay, so I just, I think that, you know, if we were to imagine a memo with a nice table, because I think these are really important questions that my colleagues have raised. It's like, these are things an HOA might have some influence over, but here are places where state and federal law are going to apply. And, you know, not to say an HOA doesn't try to write a rule that may be, <laughs> Uh, illegal, but it wouldn't hold up if it was challenged and it's not, they're not supposed to. And then, you know, I think too, Nathan, can you just speak a little bit to, um, you know, why this area is not one for local governments, what this, how the state is, is involved in the HOA issue, the statute that's involved? So, um, good afternoon, council members, Councilwoman Kanish, thank you for the question. Uh, Nathan Lucero, Assistant City Attorney. So, um, when it comes to HOAs, there, there is certainly a state statute that says how they can operate and they can draft covenants and have rules for their communities. Um, but, it, but those rules don't necessarily override um, state law or even local law, it's certainly not federal law. Um, so if you had a situation where you had a protected group that wanted to live in a neighborhood that had an HOA, 
that prohibited the number of individuals um, and, and it happened to be a protected class of individuals that, that wanted to reside uh, within this HOA. Um, it is more than likely that the, that the uh, folks that wanted to live in that community would be successful in challenging the HOA's um, regulation. Um, and it would, and it would um, they would not be, the individuals seeking to live there would not be prohibited from living there um, and the HOA uh, rule may be um, invalid on its face because it would discriminate against a protected class. Did that answer your question or did you have? Yeah, it did. Thank you very much. So I think that, um, you know, you've answered a few HOA questions in your very long FAQ, but I think for council members, if, if you'd be willing, if, if CPD and, and the attorneys could work together on a memo that really puts all this in one place. I don't know if my colleagues would find that helpful, but it feels like um, just to kind of, you know, really underscore that, you know, again, so, so even on the chapter 59 issue, even if you're in chapter 59, you have to allow eight seniors to live together. You have to allow eight folks with disabilities to live together. So I think the more we can break down what I think are kind of false protections that people are trying to find, like I, look, I won't have to do this in my neighborhood because I'm in chapter 59 or I won't have to because I have an HOA. In fact, many of the groups actually seeking this housing are in these protected classes. And so not all, you know, um, so, so anyway, I just think that, you know, the more this is, you know, that mutual education, right? Educating ourselves and then working with our community to say, you know, there's good reasons why we have these anti-discrimination laws, right? It's not just the government, you know, saying you can't, it's saying, Remember, we used to say to folks, you couldn't live in certain places based on who you were. And we created a whole historical shift to say that that's not okay. And so that's where these laws came from. And, and we believe, you know, these are things I think Denver believes in. Denver was the first city to adopt its own local discrimination ordinance, right? So um, that wasn't just about LGBTQ, it was about religion and it was about other things. So I think these are longstanding values in Denver and, and I think talking about them in the context of those longstanding values, here's why we have laws that protect the right of folks to live together in, 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 in these backgrounds. Um, so the other question I wanted to follow up on is, um, Councilwoman Black brought up the question about the Boulder co-op um, license. And I think that, um, you know, there was some feedback um, about the, the, the so some of the questions that came up in the discussion around licenses for co-ops was whether or not groups were deterred from using it or whether it helped folks come out of the shadows and get regulated, right? The goal was that, you know, we all suspect that we have folks living in violation of this ordinance today is our goal to bring them out of the shadows and, and help them be regulated and also to hold them accountable? Or is it, you know, to have, you know, and, and I think there was some feeling that the cities with the more restrictive policies were not seeing groups come out of the shadows, right? And they were seeing um, groups that may, be, you know, so I don't know, Andrew, if you want to speak to this, I don't have, I, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to recollect the conversation, but I feel yeah. like um, it doesn't mean, and then I, I'll have a follow-up comment, but yeah, if you want to chime in. Yeah, if you don't mind, I would like to break that down a little bit. Um, and so first, the, we've heard from a lot of people in this process through the, through the uh, advisory committee meetings and since who are simply advocating for being able to live with other people who they are not related to. And, and so we've heard from a lot of people who have said, you know, when I was getting my professional start, or I'm currently in a situation where I'm a teacher or firefighter, or have a hard time affording housing in in uh, in Denver, um, and want to live with uh, uh, some roommates to share housing costs, and those are not co-op situations. Uh, we also have heard from some people who are part of that much smaller movement of intentional housing that explores possibilities for people to actually earn kind of shared equity in a, in a house uh, as, a, as an intentional community. But that's only a small part of the whole universe of people who are not related, but who live together. Um, and, and what we did here, and we've looked at research in both Boulder and in 
uh, Minneapolis that uh, there are criticisms. Both those cities have a, a fairly elaborate licensing system for uh, for uh, specifically co-ops, houses that have uh, you know like a set of bylaws and that sort of thing. And what they have found in both those places is that it allows people that have the the time and the kind of professional experience with coming in through zoning processes and licensing processes and the money to afford the fees, which are in the range of fifteen hundred dollars or so in Boulder. I, I'm not sure what they are in Minneapolis, uh, but that, ha that, that has discouraged um, uh, people in lower income situations from creating uh, uh, intentional communities like that. But I also do want to highlight that aside from that, we also know of many people who just simply want to have the freedom to choose people to, to rent or to buy a house with without a requirement that they be related. So yeah, so I think that um, my hope, um, you know, is that we really can talk about a permit that works for all these different types of households that Andrew described. I actually think a permit is a way to address the concerns that, you know, some of my colleagues have raised and some of the community members have raised. But my goal is to not model it on what I think is probably more disproportionately a white middle class model, right, where there's a formal operating agreement and there is, you know, this level of formality um, and so I do think, and I'm just going to give one example from, you know, a community that I'm connected to. There are a number of transgender folks who live together um, because they may not have the support of families of origin. There's disproportionate unemployment and, you know, you know, tough barriers that folks have experienced in terms of their, um, you know, way in our communities. And so they are maybe not likely to have a formal, you know, agreement with weekly meetings and all of the formality that might get checked in some of these co-op systems, but I don't think they're any less legitimate to be able to live together. And so I do think I, my goal would be to have a permit that holds folks accountable, right, to the expectations we have for off-street parking, um, for the expectations that we have for, um, you know, making sure that your, you know, your fire code is up to, to date, but that we not add the, the things that get into how you relate to each other, right? That, that, that in fact, we don't want to take kind of what was a white model, maybe. And again, I don't want to generalize. We had the planning board, we had a queer person of color who described themselves as a resident of co-op co housing in a zone district where they were allowed. So I, I wanna be very clear that there are people of color, there are non-straight people who also are in co-ops. But I just, you know, to, to, to kind of, I guess, chime in after Councilwoman Torres's comment, I don't wanna allow one group of voices that we've heard to define the entire realm of people who might need the option. There have been other voices we've heard and I, I just identified one of them who spoke at planning board. There were other folks who also spoke about having lived with family friends, right? And they were people of color who said, you know, my family, we had this friend who came over and, you know, so, so I just think, you know, we, um, I, I just really appreciated Councilwoman Torres's comment about digging a little below the assumption about everybody's related or, or, and, or that there are only these 12 households types that 12, 12 groups that want to live like this, that there is this continuum. And, and I think our goal is to, to regulate all of them above a certain size, right? So we can discuss next time what that size is. But um, thanks for allowing me to just clarify a couple of those things. And I look forward to maybe getting some more written information to help, help us talk to our constituents about the anti-discrimination and the state laws that, that really will cover chapter 59 and they'll cover HOAs, at least for many of these types, not all maybe, but many, thanks. Thank you, Councilman Kanich. All right, colleagues, we got just under half an hour and we got three members, so I think we should be able to get to everyone. Councilwoman Sandoval. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Andrew and Sarah, for your willingness to work on this and parse it out so we can have these discussions. One, one I just want to talk about something. My neighborhood has been flyered by a group of individuals who are putting information out there regarding this process and regarding um, what this would, some of the unintended consequences, what they feel would some of the unintended consequences would be if this amendment were to be passed. And I have asked around and 
I just want to say to the people who are pushing, pushing out those flyers, I would love to have a conversation with you because you are not sharing those flyers equitably. They are not in all neighborhoods. They are not in predominantly brown and black neighborhoods. They are in predominantly white affluent neighborhoods. And so I have a, so I have a problem with the way that those flyers are being distributed. And I have a problem with some of the information that is, is being pushed out into the public um, on those flyers. I've had neighbors come to me in my neighborhood who've asked me about those flyers. And then I've walked down to other parts of the, my neighbor of the district I represent where no one has gotten a flyer and nobody is part of the conversation. So when we're talking about equity, I, I want us to talk about the equity that we all agreed to when we were at our um, budget retreat and the equity lens that we all established. And do we have implicit bias? Do we have implicit bias towards any of these projects moving forward? And so I won't harp on that much longer, but I do have, I, I feel it's not equitable to be, and, and the, the fact that some of these flyers, it's on really nice cardstock paper. I wish that some of the energy that went into printing that information went into actually also meeting with us. I have not met with anybody who's pushing out that information. So please know who, if anyone is on the line or listens to this afterwards, I would love to have a conversation with you about the distribution of those flyers. So to, so in council district one, we have the Auraria co-housing and we have, we have two co-housing in district one. We have one on a former PUD at the old Elitch site, and we have one at um, a former convent on a rare uh, aria. And they work, and I will tell you that when those two projects were being pushed into Northwest Denver, there was opposition because it was unknown. People did not, under, no, did not know. And it's not just senior co-housing. It's all ages co-housing, and during my election, I was invited to dinner to both co-housing projects so that I could see what was going on in those places. And it was a lot of women, single mothers who needed help and they were supporting each other. Some of them were elders who had sold their homes, who felt isolated and wanted to be surrogate grandparents to people who did not have family in town. And I will say that I had not gone to any of those places until I was invited to them on while I was running for office. And it was really eye-opening on how to see a not way, a not a, a different form of tradition happening in those houses. They all gathered together for dinner and it ended up working really well. And so to Councilwoman Torres's point that although I know Northwest Denver has been gentrified and major displacement has happened, there are still families out there who are helping each other. And under this proposal, I have three nieces and nephews out there who need housing. And I am concerned about them that they would not be able to have be housed in situations if we do not talk about how many people can live together. And um, in my family, I had, and growing up in North Denver, I, when I went to someone's house, I never asked if anyone was related or not related. I was just always welcomed and glad that my friends had safe places to live. And so with that, when we're talking about equity, I hope that all of us, including myself, keep the framework that we talked about during our budget process and that we are able to have these challenging conversations within our community to see what it's like if we do something bold and do and push advance that advance some of these solutions. Um, I think that sometimes having these forums where we can respectfully disagree and come to different conclusions. I think it was Councilwoman Sawyer last night during a rezoning who said not everybody was happy. Not everybody was happy on that rezoning. The developer didn't get everything they wanted. The residents didn't get everything that they wanted. And that meant it was a good probably outcome for the entire neighborhood because everybody had to give. So that is what I'm hoping that we do through this process as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Sandoval. Councilwoman Sandoval. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of questions and requests for data as we go forward. Um, first, Andrew, can you explain what the purpose of the zoning code is? Sure. Uh, it, it, it is to guide the orderly um, use of land around uh, uh, appropriate uh, transportation and other facilities in the city and to ensure uh, adequate transitions between uses and, and that uses that uh, can exist together are allowed to. So is there any other place in our zoning code where we discuss, identify, or even contemplate person types in the built environment? Not that I'm aware of. Um, is there a way that you all could bring the building code into these discussions um, in a side-by-side -side fashion? I know we're, we've heard a lot of people bring up the building code and it's interesting because we're not really thinking about building code. Um, we don't think about the building code when we're forcing people or certain types of people into certain environments. Um, and now we're using the building code to, to limit how many people can be in a household. But um, I, I think that knowing the building code and what the building code allows per square footage would be important um, in a side-by-side -side fashion with um, the data. So is it possible to add that to future presentations? And I can certainly, um, and we've had slides previously and I can, I can put them back into these decks about what the building code requirements are for, for houses. Awesome. And then for um, foster homes, where do foster homes fit in, in these categories? Are they in the household size or are they in residential care? Uh, currently they are a home occupation. Uh, so it's, it's, it, there's a, like a, a, an accessory use permit requirement. These proposed updates to the code would remove that and uh, would basically make foster relationships or other documented guardianship relationships uh, fall within the definition of a housekeeping unit. That's um, what I thought. Is it possible for um, future presentations to include some information, um, demographic information about um, foster homes in the city? That way we could understand that in context as well. Yeah, I can certainly do that. And I also, um, want to just highlight one thing that I skipped about the the purpose of the zoning code ultimately is to as a as a tool to implement our policy plans for land use as well so we use zoning to guide appropriate development in in, in, in appropriate areas where it can where people have access to daily needs um, can you in the do you guys collect racial and ethnic data for the current complaint system um, when somebody gets a complaint for a household that is suspected to be too large? We do not uh, collect that information for 311 calls. Is it possible for you all to provide a map of where we're getting those complaints from? Yeah, I, we do have a map of that and, and I will make sure I have it in the next, in the presentation when I come back next week. Awesome. And can you all bring in a map of the HOAs in our city overlaid on top of racial and ethnic demographic information, maybe even income? I, I have been looking, is, that was requested at the last, um, uh, when I came to you all on the first, and, and we don't actually maintain data on, on HOAs because the city has no role in their operation or governance, it's all a state thing. Uh, I will put an inquiry out to the, the state's uh, uh, Division of Regulations real estate uh, department and ask if they have GIS data for something like that, but it's not the data that we have. Got it. Um, that would be really helpful if we can get our hands on that. Um, I also um, wonder if in the, I saw where we analyzed other cities for their household sizes. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we could do two things with that. There are several cities that have unlimited, they don't define a household or they have unlimited amount of people um, period. And those are not included in that slide. Could we potentially include some of those 
for the household size, but also um, do a city analysis of how other cities deal with residential care and how they break up person types, if they even touch person types. Uh, yes to both. And we did have, we, we previously did on an earlier version of this table that I showed today that's in your slide deck, we did have some cities that don't regulate this at all. Uh, California um, prohibits most municipalities from doing that and, and some other, other cities in other states have done that as well. I, I took it off this list just in the interest of uh, ensuring that we had space for it, but I'll add that back in. Uh, and then um, Yes, uh, I'll bring your I, I, my your other request has just like has just slipped my mind. I apologize, but uh, uh, I'll if you wouldn't mind repeating that. Yeah, it's the city analysis of um, residential care. Thank you. Yes, we have done some of that, and I'll 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 bring that when we come back uh, to speak to you uh, in in November about residential care. Awesome. And is it um, possible for Nathan? Um, in that write-up that was requested by Councilwoman Kanich or memo um, about protected classes, is it possible to do an analysis or a case review of um, people who have filed discrimination uh, lawsuits against HOAs um, or even cities for zoning code that is discriminatory? I imagine maybe some of those cities that prohibit it or might have had situations that led to it like that? Uh, thank you for the question, Councilwoman Sinovaca. Um, there are cases that have addressed um, discrimination as it relates to um, ordinances or rules and regulations that have been adopted by various jurisdictions throughout the country. Um, so we could probably um, do an analysis or at least sprinkle in some of those cases to provide examples of what would be discriminatory. Um, but I just don't think there's time to go through a full-blown dissertation and analysis of every um, jurisdiction that may have had uh, a discriminatory policy. Well, I think it would be um, important to look at some of the large categories that we're dealing with right now. Um, we we're talking about shelters, people in community corrections, um, people in group homes. And so if you could take a particular look um, at those types of cases, that would be helpful um, because we separate our residential care in Denver um, and we break it up and often you can draw a line down the middle and the ones that we regulate are primarily, are disproportionately black and brown people and the other ones that we don't regulate are disproportionately white or wealthier people and so I want us to really get at that and um, if there are cases related that would be important. Um, last thing that I wanted to throw out there is that we know that from national data they say that at least 50 percent of people in jails and prisons have traumatic brain injuries so they at least half of the people in those situations are likely to fall under the protected classes that we're talking about. Um, I also wanted to address Councilman Flynn's um, use of equity and um, kind of just tossing it around and not recognizing that even though we currently allow unlimited an amount of people if you're related, it is people of color and LGBTQ people who tend to get targeted for discrimination. So whether they're related or not, when they're in a community, they are the ones that get the code violations. They are the ones that have people calling in to regulate their behaviors and their households. Um, that's what we wanna protect people from. That's what we wanna remove. Um, I, I also, I, I feel, like when we talk about equity, um, for my white colleagues on this call, it's important to realize that when we're having an equity conversation and there are people of color, uh, women, LGBTQ people in the room, there's a responsibility and obligation to amplify their voices, to defer to them for expertise. 
and not necessarily to insert your own experience as truth or as more valid. And that's a piece we didn't get to in our equity conversation um, when we when we did our goals and priorities. But I think that's one to dive into on our own time to make sure that we understand that when we're using that word, we can't just throw it around and throwing it around as a white person against people of color, um, I, I think it's problematic. And so that's it for my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate um, CPD's effort to go deeper on this issue. Thank you, Councilwoman Sedebaca. Um, we got about 10 minutes. We've got two colleagues who had spoken before. So, if, and for some of our colleagues who have not chimed in, I just wanted to pause to see if you wanted to, don't feel that you have to, but I wanted to make sure that was offered because I, I do want to adjourn at noon. And I appreciate the, the dialogue that we're having. And Andrew, I want to commend you for a good good job of answering what's the po purpose of the zoning code? Because <laughs> when uh, Councilman Sedebaka asked that question, I was like, ooh, you know, if you asked all 13 of us, you would have gotten 13 different answers. Um, seeing no other hands go up, I see Councilwoman Sawyer, you're back up. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so to get back to HOAs and the question we're addressing today, um, which is household size, right? Question for you guys on HOAs and household size. Um, can, and maybe this is a question for Nate, can HOAs legally regulate household size? As long as they are not regulating, right, under our, so law, legally speaking, under our, under federal law, under state law, is there anything that would al allow or stop them from regulating household size? Is there anything, like if we were to say 10 people, um, which is the proposed law on the table, if we were to come up with a compromise somewhere less than 10 people, is there anything stopping an HOA from saying, nope, we wanna stick with the original Denver law of two people? I'll, I, oh, go ahead, Nathan. I'm sorry, Andrew. Um, Councilwoman Sawyer, there is nothing that would prohibit um, an HOA from limiting the number um, more than the city does. Uh, that being said, um, if a protected class came in there and wanted to either rent or purchase one of those homes, um, they would likely not be able to prohibit that group from doing so. Okay. so. Um because that's a federal law that limits that, um, or if it were a sober living, even though that's not a federal law, that's a state law. So that's a different um, situation because it's state law, but federal or state law, right? So that's, those are the limiting factors. But other than that, an HOA could come in and limit the number of people that live um, in that HOA beyond what the city is doing, beyond the conversation we're having right now. Is that correct? Yes, they could do that, but understand okay. the enforcement so would be on them. I, I understand we're not talking about enforcement. That's a different conversation. I'm just asking, HOAs can do that. Is that correct? Yes. Great, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Councilman Sawyer. Councilman Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh... Just as a point of information, there are 998 active uh, registered HOAs in the city and county of Denver, uh, just to get an idea of the scope of trying to map them all. That would be interesting if we could, of course. Uh, I have, they're one of the group homes uh, that, that is in my district, uh, and I have a proportionate share of the, of the 200 and uh, I'm sorry, there were about 129 uh, group uh, residential care uh, homes on your map that CPD put out a while back, and uh, a dozen of them are in my district, so that's uh, slightly over uh, proportionate, but uh, one of them is in an HOA covered area, and it is, uh, and there was a lot of questioning about it by some residents, uh, not by all, and uh, it's, uh, it's been there for about six years now. And it is in an area that's covered by HOA covenants. So I think HOAs do understand that under the Federal Fair Housing Act, they do have an obligation to uh, uh, allow the establishment of, of certain protected classes in group homes. 
the uh, there, there's a lot of polarization in our country from Washington on down, and um, it's unfortunate to see it the, uh, start to infiltrate in, into local government, but it's possible to oppose the provisions of the proposal as it stands right now, but still be open to changes in the current regulations. It's not the case that we have to have people all the way on this side and all the way on that side, right? Uh, having more unrelated uh, adults living together is not a bad thing. It's already happening. The question is what's, what's the number where it starts to uh, impact on, on uh, the character of, of, our, of our diverse neighborhoods. And then finally on, on equity, what I have seen with this proposal for the last two and a half years is that these changes are being pushed by white interests. Most of the people of color who testified at the planning board were testified in opposition to it. So I think that tells me I need to pause and understand what's going on here. Uh, frankly, I have a concern that uh, some of the density, in, increase in density in our neighborhoods that this could bring is a, uh, is a threat to uh, increasing displacement and gentrification in uh, neighborhoods that are vulnerable to it, in neighborhoods where uh, uh, households of color already dominate, where land might be less expensive and so I think we need to understand the economic implications of this as well. And will this be an accelerator to displacement and gentrification? So uh, Mr. Chair, those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Flynn. All right, we got about a couple minutes left. Councilwoman Sedebach, you can bring us on. Just a quick um, question and a couple of comments. Um, do we regulate with Airbnbs? Do we regulate how many people can stay during a visit to an Airbnb? That's a that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Nate or Sarah, do you either of you know? We we definitely do not in the zoning code. No. So I think the um, I mean for any any structure there are like the health and safety codes that would limit that I'm assuming operators would have to follow. Um, but uh, excise and license would probably know best because they administer the whole short term rental program. And Nathan, I don't know if you know more, Nate. And technically, if you have, say, two, uh, two adults living in a household, and they Airbnb out their ADU, are they not temporarily violating the zoning code um, for that stay? They would not be because an ADU has its own occupancy standard in the zoning code. Uh, an ADU can be a separate household that is regulated slightly differently. Uh, it's regulated by by a person per 200 square feet. Okay, so that would be important information to also bring in um, because it's interesting um, when my colleagues bring up the element of concern um, related to profit generation. Um, you know, we're, we're okay with generating profit in the ADU setting um, without concern for the impact on, on the surrounding neighborhood, all of that. Um, and so I think it's important to bring that in too, because you could easily in, in one month have, you know, two people at a time, four people at a time, six people at a time. And it, it's not really something that we talk about a lot. Um, also wanted to point out to my count, my colleague, Councilwoman Sawyer, that you can write a lease as a landlord that says all kinds of things that are not legal at the state level. Um, and your tenant might believe that they're legal, but if they didn't and they challenged them in court, uh, your, your lease still has to follow the laws. And so you're vulnerable if you put things in your lease that are not legal at the state or federal level. And that can, and that's a similar situation with the HOAs. I also wanted to point out to my colleague, um, Councilman Flynn, that Councilwoman Torres brought up um, the element of vulnerability that communities of color are experiencing um, and might experience coming forward. If you have large households um, like we do, that are 
breaking the law, the current law, um, to be co in co-housing settings, they're not going to necessarily come forward and be the number one advocates because they're already so much more vulnerable in a range of other ways. And so there is a reason why we see the people that we see coming forward, pushing for these changes, and we don't see others who might be benefiting might, or who will benefit from the changes when they happen. So I would just encourage my colleagues, colleagues to take that into consideration. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Councilman. Ken Flynn, Councilman Flynn, you have 30 seconds. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I just want to address the Airbnb issue. I believe that's, that the uh, code would show that that's not regulated under this because those occupancies are, for thir are less than 30 days and household is, is 30 days or greater. And so there is probably no limit, uh, but we could check with excise and licenses, but it wouldn't fall under household definition. It's a temporary uh, occupancy. Would that be, uh, I see Sarah. Uh, I don't know yeah. if you wanted to add anything oh. to that. No, we're good. Your Councilman Flynn, your your clock's going off, so that tells us right now we're at noon. CPD, I want I want to thank you so much for your for your willingness to have this conversation, colleagues. I have I don't know about you, but I'm I enjoyed this conversation dialogue about this. We we very rarely have the opportunity to do this, and then we have to rush to do a vote. So I'm excited about the next three. Um, times we have to do this and, and see what happens on December 1st. So thank you all so much for that. It is 12 noon. This committee is adjourned. <laughs>